Amen, amen, amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you quickly to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. And uh, I'm gonna continue preaching on the Kingdom. This is part four, part four of the Kingdom. But Luke 13, verse 18 says, Then He, Jesus, said, What is the Kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and put in his garden, and it grew and became a large tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank You that You would cause Your Word to be multiplied in the hearts of men and women that are watching right now. I want to thank You that even as I'm speaking right now, that there is a, a healing anointing that is coming into every home into every bedroom as well. Lord, those that are sick in their bodies, I thank You for the quickening power of Your Spirit. That right now there is an atmosphere to change bodies that are riddled with COVID, riddled with some kind of a disease, riddled with whatever it is that the doctors have said today. God, I wanna thank You that You touch and move upon them in Jesus' mighty Name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Praise the Lord, Amen. Once again, I wanna just thank each and every one of you for joining us today, wherever you're watching from. I'm excited, I'm excited, hallelujah. And I know that this Word is gonna challenge you. I wanna to continue to talk about the Kingdom. And if you've been tracking with me over the past couple of weeks, uh, we've looked in the book of Daniel chapter two and how Daniel interpreted uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And of course, as we read that, we began to share how that the various kingdoms uh, came about, the various empires and how it was that one empire conquered the next and overwhelmed the next and one empire and one kingdom replaced the other. Until eventually, when you got to the end of that dream, we found ourselves at the climax of the age, uh, which is the time when Jesus comes back again. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about the fact that Jesus is coming back again. And Daniel says that when Jesus returns, there will be a kingdom in this world, a kingdom of sorts. He described it as a kingdom that would have a mixture of clay and iron representing the feet that came out of the, the legs. And we know that on both feet, we have 10 toes. So we know that it'll be a 10-toed kingdom. And that kingdom has already been formed and will be fully formed when Jesus comes back again. And of course, with regards to the return of Jesus, uh, we know that no man knows the exact time and date. Jesus said Himself, in Matthew 24 and 36, He says, But of that day and hour, no one knows. Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And of course, we can look at the signs of the times that would point to the imminent return of Jesus. Just like Jesus said, we can look at a fig tree and know that when it's putting forth its leaves, we know that Somehow, summer is near, it's around the corner. And we can look at the events that are happening all over the world. You know that there are some that would make it their mission to try and pinpoint the exact time and date, but actually to no avail. I remember I got saved in 1982, many, many years ago. Some of you weren't even born then. And in 1988, there was a gentleman by the name of Edgar Wissenet, who was a former NASA engineer and a Bible student. And he wrote the book, Why the Rapture Will Happen in 1988. He gave 88 reasons why Jesus would come back in 1988. And he said it would be round about between September the 11th and September the 13th. Well, guess what? We're still here and Jesus has not returned. That doesn't mean I don't believe in the second coming of Jesus. But I remember back then in 1988 when there was so much talk and people were selling properties and selling their businesses and doing all kinds of crazy things. I remember Pastor Fred and what he said. 
And he said something along these lines. He said, we occupy and we advance the kingdom until Jesus comes back again, whenever that day will be. We are ready, amen? So I want you to know that we are occupying, we're doing business as usual. We're about the King's business. We're occupying and we are advancing the kingdom until that time when Jesus comes back again, amen. But it's interesting in Luke 13 in this parable because Jesus speaks here about the kingdom of God. And if you've been tracking with me, I've told you before that Jesus spoke a lot of times about the kingdom of God. He actually began His ministry by preaching about the kingdom and then He ended His ministry. The last sermon that He preached before He got taken up was on the kingdom. <clears throat> And when you look at the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I mean over 100 times, more than 100 times, we see the mentioning of the Kingdom of Heaven or the Kingdom of God. And then when you look at the Apostles and you look at and ask yourself, well, what is it that they preach the most? And what is it that the early church preached the most about? And guess what? It was about the Kingdom. And I want to tell you that if Jesus preached more about the kingdom and the apostles and the early church did, then wouldn't you say that it's probably important that we not only do the same, but that we set up and take note. Hallelujah. And I think in Jesus' day, what really confused the people and His disciples was the fact that they were thinking that He was coming to set up a literal kingdom to replace the then ruling and reigning Roman Empire kingdom. And you remember that the Roman Empire as mentioned in Daniel chapter 2 was a brutal kingdom. It represented the two legs of iron that Daniel said breaks in pieces and shatters and crushes and bruises. And that's exactly what that formidable Roman Empire did. Not to mention that it was the same empire that introduced the most gruesome form of execution, which was crucifixion, hanging on a cross, putting a man, nailing a man upon a cross and keeping him up there until he died. And the Jews of Jesus' time had had enough of this imposing empire that ruled with an iron fist, that actually enslaved and raped and abused their people. They had simply had enough. And they thought that Jesus was going to literally bring a new physical kingdom that would oust the Roman Empire. And you know, family, that even today the Bible is probably the most misunderstood book, not only by those who read it once in a blue moon or once in a while, but even those who claim to know and embrace its message. And I wanna tell you that the Bible is simply a story about a king, a kingdom, and a royal family of ordinary people. The Bible, simply a story about a king, a kingdom, and a royal family of ordinary people. And as I said last week, it's a group of people that come from all diverse cultures, from all backgrounds, from all ethnicities, from all tribes and all tongues, hallelujah. I wanna tell you today, family, the Bible is not a religious book. The Bible is not a book about religion. It was never intended to be a religious book. And Jesus never did come in to usher another, another religion. Jesus came to restore what Adam originally lost way back in the garden. And what was the very first thing that God gave to Adam? It was a kingdom. And so the Bible is a story and a message about the desire of a good, loving, kind, benevolent king to, that wants to extend His kingdom to new territories through His royal family, that's you and I. And that kingdom started when Jesus came in the flesh and it started small, hallelujah. And so in Luke 19, He answers the question, what is the kingdom of God like? 
What can I compare it? And he says there, it is like a mustard seed, which a man took and put in his garden. The Passion Translation says, it is like the smallest of seeds. Hallelujah. See, it's very hard if I had to have some mustard seeds here, you could hardly see them. In fact, they're smaller than grains of salt. A mustard seed is actually smaller than a grain of salt. And the point that I'm trying to make here is that we may well begin small, but we never ever despise small beginnings. Never ever despise your small beginnings. The prophet Zechariah said it like this in chapter 4 and 10, New Living Translation. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Bump your neighbor or there at home, wherever you are, and say to them, never ever despise small beginnings. Say it one more time. Never ever despise small beginnings. The truth of the matter is that we all need to start somewhere. And we can all start with small beginnings. Small beginnings usually require a lot of hard work. And it requires a lot of dedication and a lot of commitment. And usually all of that with little or no support or encouragement. Come on, how many of you can say amen to that? It's in the small beginnings where usually you'll, you'll be all by your lonesome self. And you might think that you're by yourself, but I want, I'm here to remind you today that God is with you. He's for you. He's in you, on you, upon you. Hallelujah. And He is working with you. And in those small beginning moments, I'm here to tell you that God is working on you. He's working on your character. He's working on your attitude. He's working on your faithfulness. He's working on your integrity. And He's trying to see how much you really love Him. Or do you love Him just because of what He can give you and how much He can bless you? Or do you love Him just simply because of who He is? You know, if I look back now, I love those small beginning moments when I look back. Not when I'm going through those things, but when I look back and I reflect on those small beginnings, I realize that it was in those moments that I had to learn to get real with myself. And during those small beginning moments, we came through some hard things. And it was whilst you were in the crucible of hardship, in the crucible of small beginnings, that you learned something about yourself that made your relationship with God real and tangible. I don't know if you can identify with me on that, but look at somebody right now and say, never ever despise small beginnings. Never ever despise small beginnings. Why? Because all great things come out of small beginnings. Hallelujah. All great things. All big things. And you see that seed, he said, that seed is a mustard seed and you put it in the ground and something begins to happen when that seed is placed in the ground. I want to tell you there is nothing more powerful than when we allow the Holy Ghost to plant the seed of God's Word right into the soil of your heart because your heart is the manufacturing plant for faith. And when I talk about heart, I'm not talking about your physical organ. I'm not talking about that part of you that pumps you know, blood, and it distributes blood to every part of your body. But when I speak about heart, I'm speaking about the spirit of that person. I'm speaking about your spirit man, the real you, the part of you that has been made alive unto God when you got saved. 
That part of you that is able to embrace God and able to worship God and able to fellowship God and able to commune with God. And it's in that part of you, my friend, that faith is manufactured when the seed of God's Word is planted. And I love faith. And you know that I love to preach about faith because of what faith can do. Hallelujah. Not to mention the fact that the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And whatever is not of faith is sin. So we know that faith pleases God. And from a now act of working faith, a now faith, and an act of working faith comes big things. Hallelujah. All big and all great things come from small beginnings. Hallelujah. You know what? I want to tell you today, you can't be a citizen of the kingdom and not be involved in big things. Let me say that one more time. You cannot be a part of the kingdom, be a part of royal family, be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and not be involved in big things and in great things. We've had the wrong concept. We've had the wrong idea. All the while, we're wanting to escape this world while God is keeping us here intentionally and on purpose on this earth. You say, why, Pastor? To be the leaven in the dough or to be a light shining in a dark place or to be the salt that brings flavor to a very distasteful world that we are living in. Come on now. Do you know that many believers during this pandemic were waiting for the rapture? They were waiting to be whisked away, holding on for dear life while this whole world was turned upside down with this COVID pandemic and all that this COVID has brought with it. But God doesn't have anybody else but you and me to be hope and to be love and to be the compassion and to be the healing power of Jesus on this earth. And so for the time being, we are here. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, you're not here by yourself. You're here because God is here. We're kept by God. We're protected by God. We're preserved by God. We are prospered by God. We are favored by God. Hallelujah. Why? You say, because our mission is not over. Your mission is not over. God put you in the kingdom so that the kingdoms of this world can get a real taste of the true kingdom. That's the reason why you carry the true flavor. You carry the values and the morals and the lifestyles of the kingdom of heaven. And you and I get to show the world the intents of our King and what His intents are for the citizens of His kingdom. Can I tell you something? The only way for one kingdom to outclass another kingdom is to show its greatness. The only way that one kingdom gets to outclass another kingdom is to show its greatness. I'm reminded of when the Queen of Sheba, representing one kingdom, came to outclass and outshow King Solomon and his kingdom. And she came with her entourage. And she came with all of her riches and all of her supposed glory and all of her wealth. And she thought she would come and she would outmatch and outclass King Solomon and his kingdom by showing the greatness of her kingdom. But when she came, she said, man, I've fallen short. They didn't tell me half of what it's really like to be in your kingdom, King Solomon. I am absolutely no match. And she came to King Solomon thinking that she would influence and she would bless and she would be greater, manifesting a greater. But it was King Solomon instead that outclassed lost her and outmatched her and she went away having been blessed and influenced and affected by a greater and a bigger kingdom. See, I'm here to tell you today that you and I are part of something far bigger 
and something far greater than any kingdom or any organisation or any political party can ever offer you on planet earth. Hallelujah. Let me break it down for you. I want to remind you that you are part of something bigger than the ANC, bigger than the DA, bigger than the ACDP and any other political party. You are bigger and greater, far bigger, a part of something far bigger than the Republicans or the Democrats. You're far bigger than the feudal system of the medieval ages. You're far bigger than communism. You're part of something that's far bigger than socialism, something far bigger even than democracy or capitalism. Jesus said that this kingdom thing was so big that it would grow and grow and grow and down through the ages, the kingdom of God has been growing and growing and growing and growing, revivals breaking forth and the kingdom of God growing wave upon waves of God's glory and power sweeping across the earth from the north to the south and the east and the west and multitudes upon multitudes of people being swept into the kingdom of God, being born again. The kingdom them growing and growing until it became a very large tree. Hallelujah. And that tree has many, many branches. Now I'm here to tell you that those branches represent the many options and possibilities that exist in God, that exist in the Kingdom of God. Jesus one time said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Or you might say, in my kingdom, there are many options and many possibilities because with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. And that tree is so large, it has so many branches, that it invites all the birds of the air and all the birds of the air come and they nestle in those branches and people from all diverse walks of life are attracted to the kingdom and the beauty of the kingdom and the beauty and the splendor of the king of that kingdom. Hallelujah! They come and nestle in the branches of that tree. Why? Because as kingdom citizens, as a part of a royal family, you and I have the solution to the problems of this world. Hallelujah! Can you say amen right there in your homes today? You see, the problem with the world is that mankind has ousted God. And it's not entirely their fault. I tell you why it is, why I think that they ousted God. They ousted God because it was basically they were presented a religious and angry and unloving God by religious people that formulated this kind of God and misrepresented God. But I'm here to tell you that the King of this kingdom that I preach about is a kind and loving and gracious and compassionate and benevolent King whose intent from the very beginning was to administrate the affairs of this earth from heaven through His image reflected in you and I and thus manifest His nature and character on earth. Hallelujah. God doesn't have anybody else. He will never manifest His love through a stained glass window in a church or by the ringing of a bell or by people wearing religious garments and saying hundreds and thousands of prayer and doing sacrificial sacrifices. God's love is manifested through you and I, a people who once were not a people, but now have become the people of God and who now carry the image of God on this earth. You and I, as the royal family of heaven, we are here to manifest His love, His joy, His peace on this earth, His compassion, His mercy, His faithfulness on earth, His wisdom, His amazing benevolence. And He does it through you and I every single one of you, hallelujah, part of His royal family. You see, it's a corporate 
kingdom government. That's the idea of God right from the beginning was to have a corporate kingdom that governs. Government by corporate leadership. In other words, it's the theocratic order of a king that is over kings and priests, you and I, that are partners as we govern the affairs of heaven over this earth. This is what we call the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom government concept that was birthed in the very heart of God. And you and I, dear friends, are a part of that kingdom. You and I get to carry out that mandate. And He'll not come until we have completed the task, until we have shone for Jesus, until we have loved the unlovable, until we have reached the unreachable, until such time. Come on, doesn't matter what happens in the world. You've heard me say it. We're like the people of Israel living in Egypt. Everything happened in Egypt, but not in Goshen. Hallelujah. God will protect you. God will preserve you. God will prosper you. It will make absolutely no sense whatsoever to those round about you, to those that are in the world, to those who are governed by the economic systems and the money systems and the banking systems and the market systems of this world. They will look at you and me and say, how is it possible? Because with God, all things are possible. And that tree that I spoke about that began as a seed has many branches, many branches. You might look at a problem right now and say, God, how do I deal with this problem? But I want to tell you, there's many branches to that problem. There's many options to that problem. There's many possibilities that God has for that problem that you're facing right now. That's the concept of the kingdom. Hallelujah. And you are now a part of that kingdom. And say, so, well, pastor, how do I become a part of that kingdom? Do I have to pay a subscription fee? Is there a joining fee? Is there a membership fee? No, absolutely not. Well, do I have to recite a thousand prayers? Well, do I have to do something that would be considered as holy or righteous? No, the Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us, the best that we can be would still fall short of allowing us gaining access into His kingdom. And so God said, I'm going to do it for you because of my grace. I'm going to do it for you because of my mercy. And it'll be a gift that I want to give you. And it's a gift that He wants to give you. You see, coming into the kingdom, Jesus preached about repentance. And when He spoke about that, He said, the kingdom of God is here. So how do we get into the kingdom? Just by repentance. And I know repentance today isn't much spoken of, but I tell you what, we need repentance. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it's never to make you feel bad and condemn you even more and push you down even more. Do you know that as sinners, we know that we've sinned. We know that we're condemned. We know that we're guilty. We know that we're ashamed. But in that place of shame and embarrassment, God says, if you'll come to me as you are in that very place that you messed up, if you would come to me as you are, I will receive you. I will forgive you. I will cleanse you, wash you with my blood. And I will give you the gift of eternal life that will allow you access into my kingdom. Hallelujah. It's the miracle of all miracles. It's not something formulated by man. Would you join here by signing at the bottom of the page? It's nothing like that. It's just in your heart. And right now, God is speaking to you in your heart. Right now, wherever you are, you say, Pastor, I have no peace with God. I'm away from God. Whatever the reason is, I know that God is pulling at your heart. I know that He's tugging. He's wooing you and telling you, I'll take you just the way that you are. Don't allow that voice to say, you don't qualify. You're not good enough. You're not holy enough. That's not of God. God will always welcome. His arms are always open wide to receive you. 
And right where you are right now, right now, don't wait for another moment, don't wait for another day, right now, I believe you're ready. You have the faith to say yes to Jesus, to welcome Him as a person, not a religion. This is not a religion. It's about a living, loving relationship with a living, loving Savior, and His name is Jesus. Right where you are, would you pray this prayer? Say with me, Heavenly Father, I come to you today in Jesus' name, just as I am with all of my faults, all of my failures, and all of my sin. And right now, I open my heart. There's nothing more that I need to do. I come as I am, and I open my heart and confess that I'm in need of you, of your forgiveness, of your love, your acceptance. Right now, with my heart, I believe. With my mouth, I confess that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Make yourself real as I enter your kingdom, your kingdom. Right now, I'm entering your kingdom and I'm a citizen of your kingdom and I'm part of the royal family of God and I will never ever, never ever will I be the same again in Jesus' Name. Now I want you to stretch your hands, those of you that have needs at home, whatever the needs are. I don't know what you're up against, but you're part of something great. You're part of something big. You cannot be a citizen of the kingdom and be denied the bigness and the greatness of God and what He wants to do in your life. Tree, many branches, many options, thousands of possibilities. There's many ways to skin a cat, so to speak. Don't skin your cat, please. I'm just kidding. But what I'm telling you, you know, we only think one dimension. God has infinite dimensions. Hallelujah. There's a solution to your problem that this world hasn't even dreamt of, hasn't even imagined, and God has it for you. Hallelujah. In my house are many options. In my house, in my kingdom are many possibilities. Father, I wanna thank you that even as I've been speaking right now, there's strategies, lights are going on, that you're giving people fresh vision, fresh ideas, the spontaneity of the Holy Ghost. I release creativity to come upon people in the business realm, in the financial realm. I release the creativity of God right now. Hey, go beshende in the mighty name of Jesus that you quicken people right now. Lord, I thank you that our understandings will catch up to where you are right now, that our understanding will catch up with the possibilities, all the possibilities that you have for us. We're receiving it right now. There is a download, a spiritual download in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen and amen. Would you say after me, never ever, never ever despise small beginnings because all big things and all great things come from small beginnings. Family, I've enjoyed my time together with you. I pray that this Word has ministered. I just already sense doors opening, people have received download, ideas. Come on, we are solution orientated. And all the kingdoms of this earth will come to nothing, but not God's kingdom. It is ever increasing, it is unstoppable, and it's made up of a group of people from all walks of life. That's you and me. We love you and we're praying for you. Can't wait to have you come and be together with us in this beautiful building, but until Next time, we love you, all right? God bless you.